thanks everybody for being here. This is the webinar on updating what it takes to be a bicycle friendly community. And uh, my name is Amelia Neptune. I'm the director of the Bicycle Friendly America program. And I am joined by my brand new colleague, Anna Tang, and I will let Anna introduce herself. Hi, I'm Anna Tang. I'm the new Bicycle Friendly America program specialist, and I am super excited to be working with Amelia on all the updates for this application cycle and happy to meet all of you virtually today. Awesome. Thanks. And Anna will also be helping me um, respond to questions in the chat. So do feel free to um, pose questions in the chat or the Q&A. And um, we'll get to as many as we can today. And we're also going to be posting an FAQs later this week. Um, so if we're seeing some, some repeat questions come up a lot, um, you can check out the league website later this week for more answers uh, to your questions. So I'm really excited um, to be with you all today. This is going to be a preview of the changes uh, coming to the Bicycle Friendly Community application because it is not live yet, but it will be live this week. Um, so I'm sorry that you can't follow along while we're presenting. Um, but if you're watching the recording later, it will probably be live by the time you're watching this. But for those of you who are watching in person with us on Monday, um, we're really excited to give you a sneak preview uh, before it goes live. Uh, so first, just to make sure everyone knows who we are and why we're here. Um, we are with the League of American Bicyclists. We're a national nonprofit bike advocacy organization leading the movement uh, for a bicycle friendly America for everyone and for safer streets for everyone. Um, and we're really grateful to all of our members who make this work possible. Um, we do our work through a number of programs, the education program. I'm sure there are a large number of League Cycling instructors on the call today. Um, the National Bike Summit, National Bike Month, the benchmarking uh, website, data.bikeleague.org, a number of reports, and our work with local and statewide advocacy groups through the Active Transportation Leadership Institute. Um, and of course, the Bicycle Friendly America program, which is the reason we're all here, uh, which includes bicycle friendly states, bicycle friendly communities, businesses, and universities. And I'll be giving more of a, an introduction and overview of this program. So if you are new to the program, I encourage you to sign up for this, uh, the second webinar in this week's series on Wednesday, which will be a, a, a deeper introduction to the program and how it works. Um, but for those who just need a quick refresher, here's a little bit of um, how you can see what awards exist in your state. Um, although don't go to the website today, it was down earlier today, so <laughs> the map. Um, so hopefully it's up and running again momentarily. We're making some updates to our database. Um, but just to give you a sense of the scale of the program, we rank all 50 states every couple of years. And then for communities and businesses and universities, it's an opt-in program. So they apply for the recognition, um, we evaluate them, give them feedback to improve and give them awards uh, for those that are um, doing enough to earn the award. And it is really important to know that not everyone that applies gets an award. Um, about 60% of first-time applicants to the Bicycle Friendly Community Program actually do not get an award. Um, uh, but those who do are required to renew every four years because this is an advocacy tool. Um, so it's really about the recognition for the things that communities are already doing, but also the feedback um, to encourage them and support them in their improvements. And that's why Platinums and Honorable Mentions both get feedback. We recognize that there's room for improvement for everyone. Um, and I also want to recognize that um, being a bicycle friendly community, you know, we, we see a number of benefits to places that prioritize um, bike improvements and bike safety, bike ridership is higher in bicycle friendly communities compared to other places, uh, which has a number of health, economic, sustainability, um, equity and uh, safety uh, benefits to the entire community. But it's not that getting this award magically makes those things happen. It's that all the things that it takes to do uh, to earn the award uh, leads to all of those benefits. And that's one of the reasons we're recognized by the CDC's Active People Healthy Nation initiative as a proven strategy to increase activity friendly routes to everyday destinations. Um, so to date, we have 496 bicycle friendly communities in all 50 states. Um, but again, not every community that applies gets an award. So we've had over 800 communities apply to the program over the lifespan. Um, but last fall, we took the application offline uh, to make some updates to it because we felt like it was time to sit back and reflect and learn and listen um, and engage with, with many of you to um, update what it, what it means to be a bicycle friendly community. And when we made this announcement, this was from our blog last August, um, we said that we would be making updates in three main areas. The first was a stronger integration of equity. 
The second was uh, a revision around how we talk about on and off street bike infrastructure to reflect national standards and talk about networks, um, cohesive and safe bicycling networks, uh, which I'll talk a lot more about in a little bit. And then finally, if we're taking the applic application offline, it's a great opportunity to talk about all the latest best practices and guidance and new technologies and innovations that have come up over the years um, that, that should be reflected in a bicycle friendly community. So to give you a sense of um, the history of the program and our criteria over time, the 5E criteria was originally adopted by the BFC program in 2003 as engineering, education, encouragement, enforcement, and evaluation and planning. And in 2014, we added the uh, what we call the unofficial 6E of equity by integrating equity um, throughout the other E's, um, but sort of on a, on a very um, surface level, I, I would say. And in 2020, um, I'll talk about this more in a moment, but we removed enforcement as one of the, the five E's and we officially elevated equity as, as the fifth E. Um, and today I'm really excited to announce that with these updates, we um, are, are updating the terminology for our, our fifth E of equity to include accessibility. And I'll talk about this in a moment, um, but, the, but this is really important. Equity and accessibility are um, you know, one of the five key pillars of what it takes to be a bicycle friendly community. And I wanna uh, spend a little time talking about these two things, but we also have a webinar on Thursday where I'll go into a lot more detail about the application updates and also the program updates around equity and accessibility um, to help applicants and advocates who use the program fully understand um, what our standards are, how, how we'll use this um, standard going forward and other changes we're making, not just in the application, but in the survey, um, in the outreach process, et cetera. Um, so I encourage you to register for that some, uh, webinar on Thursday if you are interested. So equity, um, as the league has, has defined it, is the just and fair inclusion into a society in which everyone can participate and prosper. Um, recognizing that there are disparities, acknowledging that there are historically underserved and underrepresented populations, and that fairness regarding these unbalanced conditions is needed to assist equality in the provision of effective opportunities to all groups. Um, so that's the statement that's on our equity initiative website that's uh, been there since 2014. And I love this image. I use this in every presentation I give because it's a great way to show uh, the difference between equality and equity. And for me, this is really about recognizing that not everyone has the same barriers, in our case, to bicycling, um, but in any number of, of issues from transportation to health, et cetera, um, different people have different barriers and therefore different solutions are needed, different levels of investment are needed. Um, and so you're not gonna give the same bike to every person and expect them uh, to be able to get on and ride. You need to find the right, the right bike, the right investment, the right solution um, to, to make sure that the work you're doing to make your community bicycle friendly is equitable and accessible to all. Um, and I also think it's important to talk about some of those barriers and out, uh, outcome disparities that exist um, that really motivate this update to the BFC application. Uh, so in a report we released last fall, Reconnecting to the New Majority, which is an update of a 2013 report called the New Majority, um, we have some really important stats that I think every community should take a look at and think about um, in their own community, do these disparities exist? So here, um, years of premature life lost by race and ethnicity. And you can see that the um, categories of people of color are much higher um, rates of uh, lost, lost life um, years compared to the white uh, categories. Um, the same disparities exist with age where older adults um, have much higher rates of traffic deaths. Um, disparities also exist in um, the barriers that, that we see. So for example, underrepresentation of women among bike commuters. So age, race, um, gender, and disability status are just a few of the uh, different criteria that we will be looking at with the equity and accessibility section. And to talk a little bit more about accessibility, I want to really emphasize that accessibility is uh, not just about um, physical disabilities, 
there are a number of cognitive, visual, auditory, motor, and speech-related disabilities. Um, but it's also really important to recognize that not every disability is visible and not everyone with an accessibility need identifies as disabled. Um, so I really want to encourage every community to think about this as they're planning out their bike networks um, and recognize that whether it's from a disability, age, temporary illness, or injury, there are people in every single community who face mobility challenges and for whom a bike or an adaptive cycle may open up a world of possibilities to increase their accessibility. Um, so we really invite you to use these updates in the BFC application to engage with people with disabilities and to engage on the topic of accessibility in your community. Um, we, uh, this most recent National Bike Summit uh, in 2022 had a great session that's available on YouTube, and I'll ask Anna to put the link um, in the chat if you, you're interested in watching this on YouTube, um, but it was called Mobility Access, Are We Including Everyone? And as you'll see in that, um, they, the presenters made a call to the league to do better on accessibility. Um, I heard that message loud and clear, and, and um, you'll see, you know, it inspired a lot of the updates we've made to the BFC application. Um, but they make that same call to the broader bike movement. And so I make that call um, to, to everyone um, who's filling out a BFC application or has a role to play in making their community more bicycle friendly. Um, and one other video I wanna uh, point out uh, is a really great video that uh, someone introduced me to recently called Disabled People Ride Bikes, um, which is just a really important reminder that there are so many types of cyclists out there. Um, and that uh, cycling is really, um, a fantastic way to increase mobility and accessibility. Um, so I wanted to put those on, on people's radar and, and encourage you to watch those um, if you're not familiar with them. Um, so uh, once again, the, the new five E's include equity and accessibility. And with the update to the application, what you'll see is that there is now going to be an equity and accessibility section, just like all the other E's have their own section. But you will also see questions related to equity and accessibility throughout all the other E's. Um, so this is really important. All of these um, topics really are um, intermingled and interconnected um, in a lot of ways. And so we've tried to be very thoughtful about where questions are placed um, to, to get communities thinking about the interconnectedness of, of these different topics. Um, and so, for example, here's a question, uh, a new question in the engineering section that was inspired by some of the research done for that uh, reconnecting to the new majority report, um, talking about equitable uh, distribution and accessibility of end of trip facilities, including bike parking. Um, so, you know, do, doing things like an inventory of your end of trip facilities and looking at uh, neighborhood demographic overlays of where you're missing bike parking or doing an, an accessibility audit of your bike parking and seeing can adaptive cycles actually use the racks that you have in your community. Um, so these are the, some of the things that we'll be encouraging communities to do um, to make sure that their uh, infrastructure is truly accessible and equitable for all. And this question, just as an example, would get a community points for their engineering score as well as for their equity score. And here's a similar question um, under education. We've built out our in-school education section um, and uh, it includes a number of new options, but I've just highlighted the ones that are sort of accessibility specific where adaptive cycling education in school is now a checkbox. And if your um, school district offers uh, bikes for on-bike education, we ask if the fleet includes adaptive bikes. Um, so these are just another uh, a set of examples where these questions would get your community points for education as well as for equity. Um, and then the equity standalone section has a number of questions, uh, but just to give you a preview of the kinds of things that fall under the, the parent equity and accessibility section um, is this question, has your community conducted any equity centered analysis, such as a social vulnerability, uh, vulnerability assessment, equity matrix index or similar effort as part of a community bicycle master plan, vision zero action plan, safe routes to school plan, ADA transition plan, or other similar planning effort. Um, and we'll be able to share some examples of these things, um, which is really exciting. We did a great equity based um, survey of BFCs earlier this spring, and we'll be re releasing 
um, the results of that survey and a lot of the resources we learned about from communities in that survey. Um, so here are just a couple examples from some of our platinum level BFCs of equity indicator and matrix work that they're already doing. And I'm seeing more and more communities do this kind of work, which is really exciting. And we want to encourage more communities to do it. Um, Here's another new question under the equity and accessibility section. Um, it's about uh, strategies around anti-displacement programs. Um, uh, sorry, strategies and programs around an anti-displacement. Um, so asking if, if there are any programs or strategies for individual projects, um, for uh, an overall program or strategy for the entire community, or if there have been any other steps to take uh, to mitigate or avoid displacement. Um, so this is a new topic for the BFC application, but it's an important one because the topic of gentrification and displacement is one that has been um, a barrier to developing bike infrastructure and also a, a serious challenge for um, communities where uh, that is the, a, a major concern of making sure that if you're developing bike infrastructure, you're not displacing um, people by um, doing it in a way that doesn't include the people who live in that community. Um, in other words, make sure the, the infrastructure you're building is for the current residents. Um, and so this is another area where we've collected some, some good examples. We're looking for more. Um, and we'll be developing more resources around this important topic. Um, it's a session that we had at the summit this year in person. It was a really great workshop. Um, and I think we'll be able to develop more content around this. Um, but it's again, a new topic for the BFC application, but not for the bike movement. Um, and I think an important thing for communities to know as they see these preview questions is that in addition to asking these kinds of equity questions, we'll also be asking for more context about your community. Um, and I'm really excited that the census website has been updated and improved over the years to include um, very easy snapshots of things like age range, um, disability stats, um, uh, poverty rate, race and ethnicity distribution uh, within the community. So we'll actually be asking applicants to fill in all of the stats that you see here on um, your screen, but uh, we'll point you to the resources to, so that it's really easy to find this information. Um, and I, I hope that this is helpful for communities to understand that uh, when we review your application, as always, we'll be able to see where you are, what, you know, what your community looks like. Is it a city? Is it a town? Is it urban? Is it rural? Um, and also, what's the age distribution? What's the race distribution? What's the poverty rate? Um, how many households don't have access to a vehicle? Um, how, how high are the rates of certain disability characteristics, um, et cetera? And I also think this is really important for applicants to have these numbers in mind as they're answering the question so they can think about where there are unmet needs in their communities. Um, I also want to point out we'll, be, we'll have this open-ended question, A23, about any other socioeconomic or demographic data for your community that you think is significant for the BFC team to, to understand your community. Um, so for example, if there's a specific neighborhood with um, a really high rate of speaking um, another language, uh, that maybe it's not a big enough number to, to impact your census numbers, but you know there's this high concentration um, in, a, in a neighborhood. Or um, another example is, um, someone actually shared a, a real concrete example, the statewide residential Texas school for deaf and, and the Texas school for the blind are both located in Austin. Um, but many of the students live in uh, surrounding suburbs, so the census data will, will list um, most of those students as living elsewhere, or they, you know, live on campus and they're, they're traveling. Um, when they fill out the census, it's for back home. Um, so these are just some examples where we know the census data isn't perfect. It doesn't always tell the whole story. And that's where the, you're, as an applicant, you can tell us a better story for, uh, for your community to, to help us really understand the stats. Um, we've also updated the community profile section um, to help us understand some of the physical characteristics of your community a little better. Um, and this is a question, if you've been involved with the BFC program for a long time, you've probably seen this question evolve quite a bit of, um, is your community rural, suburban, urban? Um, years ago, you had to check one box. Um, over the last five or six years, we've allowed communities to check multiple boxes. Um, but we've realized that it's such a nuanced question uh, that we need to really get a sense of 
how much of your community is rural, suburban, or urban? Because we know a lot of communities increasingly have a mix of, of some of each, uh, maybe with a, a highly dense downtown urban core um, surrounded by suburbs. So you can tell us approximately what percentage of your community falls into these different categories. And that will really help our review team to better understand. Um, we're also asking about significant physical barriers that exist in your community, things like hills, um, extreme heat, extreme uh, cold and snow, um, tunnels, bodies of water, et cetera. Um, so this again is meant to, to just help us understand your application and um, your community a little better. Um, so uh, going back to our history of the five E's, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about removing enforcement as one of our official E's, because I think this is important to still talk about um, since I know some communities haven't applied since we removed enforcement. So I wanna help you understand how that change actually looked and, and what it means for the BFC program. Um, so there's some links on the screen here to some resources, including an FAQs page and a recording of a session I did at the 2021 National Bike Summit on this topic. Um, but first I wanna sort of acknowledge that um, a big reason we made this change was um, recognizing once again, the disparity in how enforcement practices have happened. This is an article from Bicycling Magazine in 2020 showing um, data from a number of cities where uh, black cyclists are stopped more often um, than, than white and other races. And um, this kind of data, you know, we see it consistently in a lot of places. And, um, you know, this is what caused us to, to rethink this, these questions. Um, but we also recognized that enforcement just wasn't the way to achieve long-term um, safety and behavior change. Um, so that doesn't mean we've removed all mentions of, of enforcement and the things that were in the enforcement section, but we do want to remove the presumption or the necessity of police involvement in things that aren't necessarily enforcement. So for example, helmet giveaways and light giveaways used to be listed under the enforcement section because in a lot of communities that's where it happens. The police department is the one that gives, gives out lights. Um, and if that does happen in your community and that's working well, um, you know, that's that's fine, that's great. But we've moved that question and expanded on it to the encouragement section to recognize that maybe it's a bike co-op, maybe it's the school, maybe it's the transit agency, maybe it's the local advocates. It could be anyone in the community, including the police, um, who are giving out lights. And we hope it's a lot of different groups. Um, what we care about is that it's happening um, and that it's, that it's reaching everyone. Um, so again, we just wanna remove the presumption that the police have to be the ones that are doing something like a light giveaway if that's not appropriate for your community or if there are other better partners um, in certain neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, we also recognize that law enforcement is still um, a safety strategy for a lot of communities. And so we wanna make sure that there is transparency and accountability in policing and enforcement practices. So the questions that we've kept that are specifically about enforcement of traffic safety um, have been moved to the evaluation and planning section because we think that evaluation and data collection is really critical. So here's a question that used to exist under enforcement around um, traffic citation data. And it is now two different questions in the um, evaluation and planning section. The first about how and what data is collected. And the second is uh, about what happens with that data. Um, so just to show you some of the answer options to that second question of what happens to the data, is it publicly available? Does it include various demographic information, um, et cetera? And um, as I mentioned, we a, a big motivation for this um, update was recognizing that there are longer term solutions. Um, there's, there's data and, and research showing that um, things like a, a traffic stop um, for speed enforcement campaign um, has a limited uh, lifespan in terms of the impact it has on driving behaviors. But designing our streets has a much longer impact. And so we wanna focus community's attention on those longer term solutions and the concept of self-enforcing streets um, is a really compelling one. Um, we're also embracing the safe system approach which, which recognizes that humans make mistakes, that um, safety is proactive, that redundancy is crucial. And so there are a number of, of steps that communities should take to, to, to make uh, their systems safer um, and starting with their bike networks. Um, so we came out with this report earlier this year, benchmarking bike networks, um, which was all about how communities are 
um, evaluating their own bike networks and measuring their own bike networks. And I was really excited about this report because I think it tells a, a great story and, and offers a great um, set of, of resources for communities to help um, understand what we mean when we talk about a bike network. Um, so what we're advocating for with these updates is um, connected networks, the safe system approach, context appropriate, low stress facilities that are equitable, an inclusive planning process, and more data and performance measures around bike infrastructure. Uh, so since the last time the BFC application had any um, major updates, a lot of new resources have come out. Um, some of these are from FHWA, um, some of these are from NACTO, and um, all of these have been integrated into the updated BFC application. Um, so to go into a little more detail about um, how we evaluate bike networks, this is the old set of questions around bike networks. Um, and really it was uh, a collection of numbers, piecemeal numbers of how many miles of, of bike lanes do you have in each category of speed. Um, but what it doesn't show to communities or to advocates is how we prioritize these things. Um, and it doesn't show reviewers how these different facilities are connected to each other, the quality of these facilities, whether they connect people to their destinations, et cetera. Um, so with the new update, there will be a couple new things. Um, the first is a worksheet where uh, applicants can download this worksheet from the BFC application and fill in um, their numbers if all the areas in green will be fillable. And then it will populate um, tallies in a separate tab to show um, summary numbers of how many uh, low stress, how many miles of low stress facilities you have versus your overall bike network, how many um, high speed roads you have that pose a problem or a barrier for bicyclists, et cetera. So I'm, I'm really excited about this update to help tell that story a little more and also hopefully to help encourage communities to inventory their bike networks a little bit more. Um, and the, uh, the green shading on that um, spreadsheet is really inspired by uh, the facility selection criteria that we've been promoting for a number of years in the BFC application, but um, we really want to call communities' attention to it. The idea that the higher speed and the higher volume of traffic on a road the more protection bicyclists should have, um, whether that's a protected bike lane or a separated shared use path. Um, you know, it, the, the context can be, um, you know, should be a, appropriate for the road. Um, so a slow 20 mile per hour road does not need the same infrastructure as a 35 mile per hour road. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, big change that was inspired by some of the new resources out there um, is uh, thinking about the principles of a, of a bicycle network as FHWA describes them, including safety, comfort, connectivity, directness, attractiveness, cohesion, and unbroken flow. Um, so we uh, are keeping some questions, but updating them to reflect some of the new resources. For example, design guidance and standards was a question before that looks a little bit different now and points to some new guidance and standards. Um, for example, these two uh, resources, one is from the UK and one is from San Francisco, so I'm eagerly awaiting and encouraging our, our counterparts at um, the, the groups that create some of our national guides uh, in the US to, to create something similar, but these are really great resources around accessibility standards and universal design standards um, to make sure that your facilities work for cyclists with disabilities and for pedestrians with disabilities who, you know, a, a protected bike lane um, with a curb might pose a, a serious barrier to. Um, so think about designing infrastructure in a way that works for all users um, of all roadway types. Um, and I see you popping on. Do you, do you, are there questions I should be answering? Okay, <laughs> cool. No, you're fine. Um, and I uh, also wanted to point out uh, in our design guidance question that um, there are appropriate guides for urban settings as well as rural settings, um, which the rural uh, guide is fantastic and it was already on the BFC application before, um, but I wanted to include it to remind myself to mention that we've made a number of other changes throughout the BFC application to try to make it 
um, more applicable to rural communities and small towns. Um, and we welcome feedback from those rural communities and small towns who use the BFC program. If there are other things you feel like we should be asking about that are uh, more relevant to you compared to a big city or a suburb, um, you know, we, we continue to want to hear input on that. Um, so moving on a little bit to the comfort and attractiveness uh, piece of uh, the, the principles of, of bicycle network design. Um, this is a new question. It, it includes some uh, answer options that were absorbed from other old questions, but these are some of the new answer options on this question. Um, efforts to pr provide shade uh, or reduce noise, um, offering seating options, water bottle filling stations, public art and murals reflecting historical or cultural information. Um, these are all new things to the BFC application, um, but not new to many communities. We know there are great examples of all of these things happening um, around the country. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to be able to start collecting data on these things so that we can share more examples with uh, aspiring bicycle friendly communities. Um, another new question inspired by a great new tool um, that exists is about um, crash metrics. So we already collected information about crash and fatality data in every applicant community. And we're adding this question about whether the community does any kind of analysis to identify high injury networks. And this is something that we're pretty sure only the big cities are doing right now. Um, and perhaps, you know, they're the only ones that have had capacity to do any kind of in-depth like GIS data um, analysis of their crash data. Um, but we are really excited that um, tool design with funding from the DOT was able to uh, develop this uh, new tool called Safer Streets Priority Finder, which is free and open to the public. Um, and it's open source. And I strongly encourage communities who have crash data to use it um, to develop their own crash analysis of um, high injury networks and, and to prioritize areas that need uh, attention from a safety standpoint. <clears throat> and um, on the topic of connectivity, here are two examples of questions uh, on the application. The first is in the engineering section, and the second is in the evaluation and planning section. But talking about connectivity, um, for the first time, we'll ask communities to upload a map of, of their bike network. Um, and if they don't have a map, we'll ask them to explain why. And also we're asking what resources or guidance might be helpful in supporting your community in the development of a current bike map, um, because we do wanna help and be a resource. Um, so if we're seeing consistent um, needs or barriers or challenges from communities that don't yet have bike maps, um, that might be something that we can you know, figure out how to, how to help those communities. Um, but this doesn't need to be a public facing map. It can be an internal, planning uh, focused map. Um, in some cases that might even be better than the public facing map, um, but we would like to be able to see what kind of uh, you know, uh, mapping you've been able to do of your network and, and what your network looks like. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, the benchmarking bike networks report that we did earlier this year um, highlighted five cities that uh, uh, that have seen high ridership increases and, and um, a lot of network development um, and network growth over time. And Oakland was a city, one city that we highlighted that has just really great extensive GIS data on their bike network going back all the way to the 70s. So they were able to provide us with um, enough information that we could, you know, create a graph showing over time what types of bike facilities they've had um, and what their current bike network looks like. Um, and I think this is really interesting to think about what shows up on their BFC report card versus what kind of data they have. So um, the report card I think of as an advocacy tool and we want it to be a tool that's useful for local advocates to bring to their decision makers and say, um, we, you know, these are the areas we need to improve on. Um, but for Oakland, um, you know, the, these two numbers that we showed on our BFC report card really didn't tell the whole story. Um, of high, high speed roads with bike facilities, that 76% sounds amazing. Um, but once we dug into their data, they only had uh, five miles of high speed roads um, uh, according to their BFC application data. So, you know, we recognize that this number, um, you know, for some communities, it's not relevant because they don't have high speed roads. And those communities have told us they feel like, um, you know, it looks bad on the report card that it says NA. Um, 
And in fact, for us, it's a really good thing that they don't have high speed roads. Um, so later this fall, we'll be releasing a new and improved um, BFC report card to reflect all the changes in the application, um, but also with, with a lens on this advocacy tool piece um, to help tell the story of the community's current status and room for growth. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to mention that at this part um, so that people know that that's coming as well. Um, so jumping back to the application, um, uh, two other great resources that have come out from FHWA over the last uh, five or so years um, include these two guidebooks on um, measuring multimodal network connectivity and developing pedestrian and bicycle performance measures. Um, so we, we've integrated some of these resources and, and taken inspiration from them um, in the evaluation and planning section. So you'll see some new questions that reference these guides and sort of the, the standards established by these guides. Um, and now I'm going to jump into um, other new sections of the application, because as I mentioned earlier, um, taking the application offline to do equity work and infrastructure work also gave us an opportunity to reflect on what else is missing um, from the BFC application um, and also what could be removed. There were some things removed, um, but I'm mostly focusing today on what new things there are. Um, so uh, one new section under evaluation and planning is focused on public engagement and outreach. Um, so there's a question about whether your community has a public engagement or participation guide or toolkit, um, and if so, how it's uh, influenced uh, public input processes for bike projects, um, if at all. And um, generally, if the community has any requirements or standards for public participation that are designed to empower residents and ensure a robust and authentic community participation process. Uh, and this is inspired by the um, spectrum of public participation, uh, this, this chart that you might be familiar with, um, that talks about the spectrum from inform to empower of public participation. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've taken some inspiration from this and in, want to encourage communities to think about their public participation processes and um, how much they're, um, you know, engaging with the community um, and, and residents and, and making it easy and accessible for people to participate. Um, so some of the other new questions in that section, um, some long checklists of, of the various ways you can seek public input and engage local residents throughout the ongoing planning process. Um, and then all the ways that those things can be more accessible and inclusive. Um, so things like offering childcare at public meetings, offering language translation, um, having face-to-face -face tabling or in-person um, things happening in the community where people are at grocery stores, at parks, at schools, at barbershops, at churches, et cetera. Um, so not expecting people to come to you at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday, every, you know, once a month um, in order to be able to share their input. Um, and uh, we also recognize that there are a lot of community partners who are really essential to partner with um, for the engagement process. So this is the um, sort of, you know, in, in that same section, public engagement, um, but also for education and encouragement. So you'll see similar questions in those sections about what other partners, you know, even outside of the normal typical biking groups, um, are you engaging with to make sure that your bike education and your encouragement efforts are reaching everyone? And along those lines, uh, we're expanding the uh, section around clubs, bike clubs, under the bike culture and promotion section of uh, encouragement. And um, I actually took screenshots of the online application to show how this works a little bit, but um, the, the parent question is, are there any organized social or recreational cycling clubs or groups active in your community? And this question existed before as just a checkbox to tell us what kinds of clubs. Um, but we've, we've realized over the years that um, engaging with those clubs is really important. And so we want to encourage applicants to actually get to know those clubs and, and, and engage with those clubs, even as part of their BFC application process. Um, so we're asking uh, communities to provide the club a group name, and if they have it, a website. Um, the contact fields are optional, but highly encouraged because if they are included, we'll be able to send them the public survey. 
um, to get their input on the, the, on the BFC uh, application and, and um, get their involvement in, in the process. And I really want to emphasize that, um, you know, the, a lot of people think of the BFC application and um, award as focused solely on the city or the local government agency. And most of it is focused there. Um, but there are pieces um, of, of being a bicycle friendly community that really require, um, you know, all kinds of groups and um, bike clubs are a really essential part. Advocacy groups are a really essential part to having a positive bike culture and fostering um, a really inclusive um, biking community in your in your town. So it's not just up to the city agency staff and, and we wanna make sure that um, we're encouraging conversations between those different stakeholders in the community. Um, so this is just one example, but really emphasizing that that human connection and, and encouraging it to happen at the local level through the BFC application process. Um, so here's just how it would look once uh, you start filling in the um, clubs on your application is like I mentioned, the contact fields are optional. Um, but just, you know, making making sure that you're actually aware of all the clubs and um, we felt like this would be a good exercise and it also helps us to really see the variety of, of clubs. Um, so next, moving on, um, funding is a section that you, there were already a couple questions around funding. Um, but we've expanded them, including a couple of fields where we're asking communities to, to show us the public link to their um, capital improvement budget, if, if it exists, or their operating budget and their transportation budget. And the reason behind this is really, you know, help our reviewers understand where your community is placing its priorities um, as, as told by the budget. So um, going back to that quote of show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Um, another thing we're adding to the funding section is a question around what sources of funding do you use um, to fund bike infrastructure and programming in your community. And this is one of those questions on the BFC application that is more for you than it is for us. Um, this is really meant to be an educational tool to help point out the various sources of funding that might exist for a community. Um, and it also helps us see where communities that have funding opportunities but aren't taking advantage of them, maybe that's another thing um, the league could help with. And um, you know, maybe it's it, it can help inform our policy work and um, our advocacy work to see um, you know, what education is needed. Um, so just as an example, uh, we did a BFC newsletter last week and included this. So if you are a current bicycle friendly community, check your inbox last Thursday. Um, it includes a link to this. Um, website where, that we're keeping updated as things change around federal funding resources, um, but now felt like a really important time to add this to the BFC application uh, because there is a lot of new funding opportunity uh, for local bike infrastructure coming, coming down from um, the federal bills. So it's, it's really exciting and we wanna help you um, and every community in the BFC program take advantage of these opportunities. Um, just a couple new other new sections that I'll mention, um, an expanded section on maintenance of infrastructure. Um, so the ongoing maintenance, a lot of these questions already existed, but we pulled them together to, to really emphasize the importance of maintenance. Um, a brand new section is around regional coordination because we recognize a lot of commuters travel across jurisdictional borders and we want to encourage communities to work with their neighbors um, to build cohesive networks for people traveling between jurisdictions. This isn't relevant to every community, but for those that it is, um, you know, we, we really want to emphasize it and encourage you to work with your neighboring communities or your county or your MPO. Um, and also, again, as advocates, um, encouraging communities to partner with neighboring jurisdictions to influence, influence legislative policies at the state, county, or regional level. Um, so thinking about yourselves as advocates um, for things like funding at the state level. Um, and this is, um, you know, will, will help us review and, and evaluate your community, but this will also help inform our advocacy work. Um, so you'll, you'll see that's a running theme um, with some of these updates is helping us to help you better. <laughs> um, and again, I'll point out the uh, expanded community profile section. Um, just to say that for something like the regional coordination question, if we see um, in the community profile section that um, you know, certain topics just aren't relevant to your community. That helps us understand how to weight some of these questions that I've been showing you. 
um, differently. Uh, and something you'll see throughout the application is more opportunities to tell us more. So if we offer a whole bunch of checkboxes, but you're doing something else, um, there will be an other box more often than there used to be so that you can check that. And if other, please describe. Um, but we, we've still designed the application as a lot of checkboxes uh, to try to educate and inform and encourage communities to take some of these actions that we're seeing. Uh, so one more new section I'll point out is inclusive bike education. Um, and here's just a sample of uh, some questions around, um, for example, efforts to increase the diversity and representation of league cycling instructors or other credentialed bike safety instructors. And do any of your LCIs or other bike safety instructors have additional uh, uh, trainings or certifications, for example, um, training working with neurodiverse students or people with disabilities. Um, and if terms like neurodiverse are new to you, uh, something else we'll be offering is a glossary of terms, um, which includes everything from the infrastructure um, terms like WUNERF and DOT and um, uh, MPO that we use, all the various acronyms, but also some of the equity related terms um, that we know are going to be new to some communities. Um, the other resources that uh, will be linked from the application include the infrastructure worksheet that I talked about a moment ago, as well as some other worksheets. Um, the one on the screen is one to help communities tally up their full-time equivalent um, employee hours, which is a question we've had for years and we want to keep it, but we also want to offer better guidance on how to tally up, uh, you know, the number of staff hours you have focused on bike projects in your community. Um, so this will be a spreadsheet you can download, fill in your community's answers, and then um, get, the, get the answer here and, and upload the spreadsheet so that we can learn from your community and, and inform other communities about, you know, what we're seeing. Um, so we've, we've worked similar to these um, to add in-application guidance and support um, throughout the application, and this will actually continue to grow after the launch. Um, but just for example, if your community says there isn't a complete streets ordinance um, and you check none of the above, this box will appear only if you check none of the above, um, pointing to some resources. So we've tried to be selective so that the application doesn't get too overwhelming with this, but if you're a community that's just starting out and you're trying to figure out um, where to begin, going through the application process and checking no to a whole bunch of things might've felt a little useless before, but now hopefully um, it will point out uh, the resources. So not only do you know your deficiencies, but you know how to improve on them. Um, and these are things that we can continue to update and, and point to new best practices. And this is part of the reason why we ask you for your examples sometimes so that we can um, learn from you and help other communities learn from you as well. Um, another thing we've done with this application update on the topic of um, helping communities see their deficiencies is pull out topics. Um, so for example, this, this is an old question. I don't know how well um, folks can see that on the screen, but it was sort of a catch-all question for the various types of policies that might um, help influence uh, the bikeability of a community. So we've got um, you know, paid car parking and car parking standards in here, as well as um, uh, accommodations of bicyclists through construction sites, et cetera. Um, so we've pulled out some of these things into different uh, topics of questions. So there's one question focused on um, land use and development, and one question on um, motor vehicle parking and traffic, um, et cetera. So, so questions are a little bit more targeted, and that helps you see more easily, oh, we don't have anything on the topic of land use or anything on the topic of uh, motor vehicle parking and traffic. So let's look at that question and see what else we could be doing. Um, so with that, um, the, I'll, I'll just share some next steps of, of what you all can expect. Um, the application, like I said, will be live later this week, and everyone who's registered for this webinar will get an email as soon as it is. Um, the fall submission deadline will be September 29th. Um, if you do decide to apply this fall, we know that's a short turnaround, but if you do, um, the public survey period for the fall round will be in October. 
and the awards will be announced in December. And like I said earlier, we will be uh, releasing revised report cards December as part of um, that announcement. And um, you can also expect to see a lot of the BFC materials being updated over the next um, six months. So things like the um, fan infographic that you might be familiar with, the report card, the quick assessment, the survey, all of those will be going under cha undergoing changes as well. Um, and again, I want to point out some other webinars we're doing this week. Um, if you're new to the BFC program, I'm sure you learned a lot today and it was probably very overwhelming, but if you want to take a step back and get an intro to the program, um, on Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, I'll be doing a webinar about um, sort of the basics of the program, how the online application works. Um, so also, if you just haven't applied in you know, five years or more, it might be helpful to join that one. And we will be recording it, so feel free to just register so you get the recording afterwards. Um, and then on Thursday at noon Eastern, I'll be doing a deeper dive into the equity and accessibility updates, including program changes, not just the application, but things like the survey um, and the evaluation process for communities. Um, so both of those webinars, the links are on our website at bikeleague.org slash community. And um, I anticipate this being a very popular question. When is the next deadline after September? Um, February 15th will be our spring 2023 submission deadline. Um, and those awards will be announced in May. So if you are one of those communities that's eager to apply and has been waiting so patiently for us to release these updates, um, your next two opportunities to apply and be evaluated are September 29th for a December awards announcement or February 15th for a May awards announcement. And then after that February deadline, we anticipate getting back onto our normal schedule of a February deadline and a um, August, September deadline, um, but earlier in September um, going forward. So the application will be open consistently and about six months between um, submission deadlines. Um, so with that, um, I have uh, my email address and Anna's email address here on the screen. And I have been ignoring the chat, but I can um, look at it now. And Anna, if you have any other um, questions that have come up that you want to flag for me, um, I think we have a few minutes. Awesome. Yeah, it has been a flurry of conversation <laughs> <laughs> in, in the comments. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't grouping them like on a separate document like I usually do. But there has been a lot of discussion about like, how are you going to consider like the different size populations of communities and taking that into consideration when you're judging them versus like a rural or an mm -hmm. urban or a suburban. Yeah, so that's something that we'll be, um, we'll be able to release more details on towards December this year when we come out with the new report cards, but we are hoping to really develop a, a much more transparent sort of matrix to say if you're a small community, these are the standards, if you're a big community, these are the standards, so that communities have a sense of, of what's reasonable um, to be expected of them and what their peers are doing across the board. Um, so the, the beauty of the BFC program is that, you know, it has been designed over the years to really work for communities of all shapes and sizes. Um, we have a small town with 588 people is our smallest BFC. Um, I think our biggest is New York City. So, um, you know, it, historically that's always been the case, but it's been hard to tell from the outside just how that works and, and trusting that it, um, you know, the, that a small community would really be um, judged by uh, appropriate standards compared to a, the big cities that um, you see in most of our announcements. So um, we are hoping to provide more um, specific guidance and, and answers about that um, later this fall. Okay. Um, another question was about crash data and how it'll be calculated. Yeah, so we'll still ask um, similarly to how we have asked in the past, which is um, total so it's the average annual number of crashes over the last five years. Um, and we ask that number for um, crashes and for fatalities. Um, for crashes, it's been, um, there's always been a checkbox, or at least since I've been with the program, there's been a checkbox to say whether or not you collect crashes. So we know some communities don't even have that data. But if you do, you're asked to report the annual average number of crashes over the last five years. Um, and we're keeping that consistent just so that we can continue to look 
at um, changes over time from communities. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for communities as well. <laughs> Uh, someone has their hand raised. I was going to let them talk if that's possible. I don't think the, so we're on a webinar instead of a meeting. So I'd encourage them to put in the chat if you can. Okay. So Keith, okay. if you don't mind um, typing your question in the chat and then I can say it out loud if that's possible. Um, cool. And I see the most recent question, any thoughts on a rural county, uh, rural counties applying as a community? Um, so we do have counties apply to the program. Um, we've also had MPOs and regions apply together as, as a single community. I think the, the biggest challenge for applying as a county or a region is um, sort of the, uh, the consistency question of um, if one community in the county is doing a lot, do you take credit for that on the application if it's not actually representative of what's happening across the county and sort of how to reconcile those differences um, within the community uh, or within the county? Um, so that's a, an important question and it's part of why we've added those regional coordination questions because we want to encourage individual communities within the county to start working together more so that if the county did want to apply, they could say, oh, look, we've all been working together on shared policies um, for years now. Now we, we're ready to apply as a county. Um, and we do have cases where the county and the community within the county are both BFCs and sometimes they're even different award levels. Um, I think the other thing I'll flag about counties applying and especially rural counties, since that was the question, is uh, because we ask for your entire road network, uh, sometimes those numbers are going to look really intimidating when you're comparing bike facilities to road facilities, um, because we know you'll, you'll have a lot of, um, you know, big highways or arterials between communities and, and every single one of those miles in between the communities needs to re be reported on the application if you're applying as that county at that county level. Um, so just be aware that some of those things uh, might not look very favorable the way um, we ask for it um, at a sort of community scale uh, for a county versus an individual uh, city or town. Um, so I hope that helps. And if you have more questions, feel free to email us. Um, also, could you talk about communities that are reapplying and how their status can be maintained or what will happen with the new questions? Yeah, so uh, one thing that's really important to us here is not leaving any communities behind with this update. Um, so we, we want to encourage every community to take the new criteria and standards really seriously, um, but we don't want you to... Um, uh, uh, you know, worry that uh, if you're not doing these things right now and you're up for renewal, um, that you'll just lose your status. Um, so I, uh, I, uh, what we've decided is that we'll we'll give every community one application round with the current application, um, where if you are completely lacking in some of the new areas you'll sort of be um, given, given one free pass. Um, and um, as we uh, see you renew, we'll expect um, improvements and we'll, we'll be really specific about that in your feedback to say, um, you know, this is, this is great. In four years time, we hope that you can do X, Y, Z. Um, and at that point, um, you know, we, we do want this, these new standards to be taken really seriously. So um, if communities, if it's appropriate for communities to be demoted or to lose their BFC status, that might be the case, but we really want to um, uh, see the, um, we want to see communities, you know, take these, these criteria seriously and, and um, uh, hopefully make, make improvements with the resources and, and guidance that we're able to offer. Um, and I see the activity around the crash data on the BFC application. So the way we've calculated the BFC application, or sorry, the BFC report card crashes um, is separate from how communities report it. So the way communities report it on the application is just the raw number of crashes. On the report card, historically, we've, we've compared that to the ACS data, which yes, I agree that is flawed, especially for tourist communities um, or communities where ACS really doesn't tell the whole story. Um, and I didn't include it in my slides, but we are asking some new questions around what is your best estimate of your community's mode share um, so that you can tell us what the real number is if ACS is um, not, uh, not accurate. 
Um, and that's where we really encourage communities to do their own counts um, so that you better understand um, ridership um, and not just commuters, but you know anyone who's riding a bike for transportation, for recreation, um, encouraging that data. Um, let's see, and I know we're, we're just about at time. So um, what I'll say is that we will download the full list of questions that we've received. And if we haven't answered your question, um, we will be publishing an FAQs document as part of this um, uh, update. When, when we launch the application, there will be an FAQs um, and also our, our contact information will be available. So if you have more questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us. And um, I wanna thank everybody for attending today. Um, and I'm really excited to work with you all on your renewal or your new BFC applications. Um, and we welcome your questions and your feedback once you are in the application using it. Um, so thank you everybody. Um, and uh, look for more details from us very soon.